Hello and welcome to another episode of Our Black Gay Diaspora podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Julius J. Johnson Weaver, the founder and chief physician of Resolve MD, a primary care medical practice. RMD is Resolve MD's gender affirming care led by Dr. Johnson Weaver, a trans non-binary black physician. The facility provides gender affirming hormonal treatment for trans and gender expansive individuals. As a public speaker, Dr. Weaver has spoken as, at various events, which includes OutCare Health's November 16, 2023 OutTalk series titled Gender Affirmation, a Social and Medical Lens. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Weaver received the governor's citation for their work with COVID-19 and is one of the GOVEX ambassadors for the state of Maryland. Appearing in TV commercials, Dr. Weaver is currently in ads throughout the Baltimore, Washington Airport and Maryland Motor Vehicle Agencies, promoting vaccination against COVID-19. A medical professional and community member, outspoken against racism, sexism, homophobia, and negativity against transgender and gender diverse people. I look forward to learning more about Dr. Weaver's journey and how they use their insights and experience to educate and celebrate those around them. Welcome, Dr. Weaver. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me here on this day. It's rainy here and cold, so this is a nice um, thing to kind of do and, and, and bring up the mood of the day. And you're based in Maryland. Right. So I am uh, currently in my office in uh, Columbia, Maryland, um, just to pay homage to the indigenous folks. This is also Susquehannock and Piscataway, um, unceded lands of the Susquehannock and Piscataway people. Thank you for that. You're the third person in three different countries to honor the original inhabitants of, of these lands that we live in. I do think it's important and I, I don't always do it and I'm trying to be much better because it's you know it is it is their land <laughs> and we have to to give credence so. <laughs> I uh, didn't mention uh, before we started recording that I actually have family in Maryland and Bowie oh great yeah Bowie is not too far from here I do love when I come to visit Maryland Maryland's a great state I mean I've lived here now for I would say over 10 years, and I do think it's it's home. I moved around a lot when I was younger and um, a few places in my professional career, but this is a great place to be. The proximity to D.C. as well as Baltimore, and honestly, it's sort of the, the life with like folks of color who are doing well and queer and trans, the, the communities are very strong. So we are nine days into 2024 so happy new year i don't know if we can still say that nine days in but uh how how has your new new year been so far uh, a lot of this new year for me is remembering to reflect on the past year i don't know about you but the holiday season gets so busy with hustle bustle and it's also sick season so doctors are busier and so here comes New Year's Day and you're supposed to sort of know all the things you want to do for the new year. And it, it's it's not like that. So I'm trying to remind myself about like this month of January to, to really reflect on the things that happened last year before truly kind of mentally moving forward into some other projects and things. Hmm. Sounds very healing. Yeah. So do you are you someone who makes New Year's resolutions? I do sometimes, but I I also am very cautious a lot of people come to their doc with their resolutions and because they're a lot of often are around like health and well-being like i want to lose weight or i want to eat better and i find it kind of burns people out <laughs> you know it's kind of like that that feeling of going to the gym and everyone's there in the first few weeks and then the next few weeks it's less and less people it's because we've all made these resolutions to go and lose weight and they're hard to sustain and people tend to fall off and I know resolutions can be positive, but I also think sometimes they put a lot of stress on people to, to act and be in ways too fast. So um, this year, I really tried to make sure, again, that my resolution was really to reflect in the first part of the year, at least the first quarter of the year, uh, knowing okay. that spring is coming and maybe that's the time where more action is needed. I know we talked about you know the first nine days of the new year, but just maybe to kind of settle us into this moment, how's your day going so far? I know you're midday in uh, Maryland. I'm currently in the UK, but how's your day been so far? 
It's been a usual hectic day. <laughs> I am a parent of three teens, um, one teen who's kind of going through a few physical challenges right now um, and is at home. And um, I'm partnered and also have a bonus um, younger kid. And so personal life is typically very, very busy um, before even starting the workday. Um, and then, of course, the workday is a bit, bit hectic. So well, again, thank you for joining me. And I'm not a parent, but I, of course, have family members and friends who are parents. So I know that that is, you know, I always say the most important job in the world. So, uh, you know, thank you for your service in that department. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mentioned in the intro about Resolve MD. Can you share about uh, Resolve MD? Sure. So this is my own private practice. I opened it about six years ago. I've been practicing for a few decades and I've been with big organizations where I've been the, the, the head physician in those. And I really am a bit of a creative person. And I, I find when you're working in large organizations, it, it can be, especially as a physician, it can be a bit stifling. You're really just seeing patients and that's fun, but there's some other parts of me that I wanted to explore. And the entrepreneurial side was one of them opening my own practice sort of checked some of those boxes and and gave me some some energy and passion and so so that's where resolve md was born i decided not to be with big organizations anymore um, be my own boss and this is a primary care practice um, based on a monthly fee as opposed to insurance base so patients pay a monthly fee to be seen uh, we don't bill insurance at all if you need insurance to see a specialist or to get blood work you can but other than that, you're paying that monthly fee. And in turn, you're getting a, a more personal experience. I like to know my patients. I like them to know me to a, you know, to an ex, to a professional extent and feel comfortable. So I have patients who will see me, you know, a few times within a couple of months and others who only use me a few times a year, but they all know that when they call, they're gonna get me and and they like that. And I like that kind of relationship, that doctor patient relationship as well. So that is the basis of Resolve MD. And then I tend to have some creative outlets in terms of different initiatives for things like my newest, which is the gender affirming care program. I started this, uh, not this year, actually, then last year in 2023. Yeah, I saw some of your testimonials on your website and saw that, you know, people are really happy to be working with you. And I know me going to the doctor, that's always like, oh, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. I do think it's the care that I've always dreamed of providing. And I was to an extent being a able to provide that in the larger organizations, but this just allows me to, to, to deepen into that a bit more. You mentioned about RMD Proud. Is that, uh, can you share about that? So RMD Proud is a gender affirming care program. So I am a transgender, non-binary um, physician. And I believe that my lived experience, as well as my medical knowledge, is really um, something that can benefit um, transgender and non-binary patients. And so I started the gender affirming care piece last year, January 2023, which is still based on a monthly uh, subscription model where you pay a monthly fee. I am providing hormone care for folks who want to transition horm hormonally. So not all transgender and non-binary patients want to do that, but uh, a large number do. They want to take testosterone or estrogen or other uh, medications that help them shift uh, their physical body to align more with how they, you know, their true identity that they feel uh, deep, uh, deeply. To be able to provide that really excites me. Um, I am, you know, on a personal level, I am transitioning hormonally myself. And I know some of the challenges that I faced finding the right physicians, uh, finding even just a general primary care doctor that wouldn't sort of raise their eyebrow <laughs> uh, when I walked in and I asked to be called this and when I want my pronouns to be uh, respected and to even have knowledge about the hormones that I'm on. Um, so to be able to provide this type of care to my transgender uh, and non-binary siblings really um, excites me. So it's, it's just been a wonderful addition to the practice. Now, are you just working with patients in the Columbia, Columbia, Maryland area, or do you go outside of that? I right now can offer care to anyone in Maryland because the care is primarily virtual. 
Um, so uh, people can, yeah, we can have virtual visits, um, which is nice because I do think that there's some pockets of Maryland that really do not offer this type of care. And I do think what's exciting about my practice is, is there's a lot of access. And when I talk about some of the obstacles I faced, um, that was one. There are doctors who provide this type of care, but you might have to get on a waiting list. And when I say that, I mean like a waiting list of like months. And so this type of access that I provide where, you know, I had someone join the practice a, a week or two ago. And within a couple of days, we got them started on the hormones that they were interested in. Now, is the wait because of the numbers that they may have or is that just standard procedure? The wait is a lack of providers offering this type of care. That is the largest factor, I believe. Um, I know you're coming from a personal place, but how has it been for you to see the, the benefits of what you're providing to your patients? I say this all the time. It's, it's, it's healing, um, truly healing, because to uncover that you are trans yourself, you have to really wade through a lot of the things that you were told about trans people. <laughs> and we all don't realize it. similar, and I know some people don't like when we liken it to race, but there's a lot of black negativity that we all digest through our entire lives. And to some extent, a lot of us are aware of it, and to some extent, we're not. And so we all have a level of ingrained sort of stereotypical messages that we have that affect the way we interact with people and even move through the world. And the same thing for being transgender. I give this example. There's um, a great movie that breaks down some of the movies that shows trans people in history, um, in movies in the past. And a lot of movies, there'll be a, a person who's considered like a, a cross-dresser um, or a transsexual, sort of these words that we don't use now. And in those movies, those people are treated terribly, you know. Uh, there was a movie, Ace Ventura, I think, where at the end they found the person who was who appeared to be a cis woman, they found out was was trans, and mm -hmm. everyone started vomiting. And it's like, it was supposed to be funny, right? Like, that's the end of the movie. Everyone cracks up. I mean, I watched that when I was a kid or a teen. I don't remember when I watched it. But you don't even know, like, how inappropriate that is. And then it's part of your psyche. So if there's something inside of you that's telling you you're trans, you might unconsciously sort of like push that away. So I, I say all that to say, there's just so much undoing you have to do to be courageous and come out to be trans. And um, to be able to offer access to people as well as for them to see a thriving trans person, which I am, that gives me way more than I give them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I could say myself as, as a black man, as, as a gay man, that even though I may think I am evolved enough because of those experiences that in some ways may make me a little bit more empathetic, that I'm still having to unlearn things, even around those things that are a part of who I am. You're, you're educating and, and you're offering uh, a safe space to uncover and discard, you know, some of that stuff and to replace it with, with a lot of positivity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What is the meaning behind the names? Because I know that's always um, something that's part of the process of being an entrepreneur, being a business owner. It is. It is. And I, I'm glad you asked that. And I think the resolve is a, a sort of an obvious one, but also not where the the resolve came from, but it, it truly is about the resolve that on one level, the resolve it took to open the practice as it was a very big step for me to step away from the big organizations. And I was leaders in those organizations to go and open a private practice. The trend at that time wasn't to open private practices. It's actually for doctors to move from private practice to big organizations because there's a lot of security and stability. And so there was raised eyebrows from my colleagues, like, what are you doing? You're going to give up a stable, very good salary to open your own practice. Um, I was also recently divorced um, to my kid's dad. So, and my kids were early middle schoolers. So I was not only juggling the full-time job, but also the kids while trying to open the practice. 
And so I, it just took a lot of determination and grit. And, and honestly, I'm not even quite sure in the beginning, like, how did I get through that time? Um, but resolve was the only thing that, like, when I thought about, well, what is the name of this practice going to be? It was like, it's resolve. But so that's one part, the personal part. But then the second is thinking about patience. And I wanted this doctor-patient relationship to sort of be a back and forth, less of that sort of hierarchy, me telling you what to do, and really sort of getting to know you, which is really important because the social determinants of health are really what kind of determine success. And so if I don't know you socially and the things that you're up against, and if we can't talk about those things, then I'm not sure we're going to really make any gains if we're talking about your overall health and well-being. I want people to realize when they are coming here, they are showing a level of resolve when they're working on their own health and well-being. So it's it's sort of a resolve in many in many different ways. And then adding the MD was just to make sure people knew it was it was run by a, a physician. Um, I felt that in my own just experience going to uh, to a doctor not necessarily maybe conscious in the moment, but the fear of maybe asking certain questions or it being a, a, a relationship. And I know that I'm not the professional. It sounds like you leave space open for people just to say, this may be a silly question, but I need to ask it. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I think that's how it should be if we're going to do the healing work that we really spent all those years in school to do. Um, and I, I typically attract patients who sense that from me. Again, like you're saying, I'm allowing that space for people to kind of feel seen and heard. There's not a lot of um, grace for that <laughs> in the, the bigger organizations. It, you know, there, there's a certain bottom line that you need to meet. But then going back to your question about RMD Proud, I know in the in the queer community, you know, pride is just something we have to have on our like we're out loud about because of so much is thrown at us to not not be who we are, not to be authentic, not to be proud of who we are. And so it was just a play on words, you know, RMD proud, you know, be proud that this is a a step that you want to take to be your most authentic self to start hormones. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of courage. And so um, that's where RMD proud came from. What is your educational background? I um, went to college at Princeton um, in New Jersey and then took a year off for a nonprofit in Philadelphia, just a bit of a breather, and then went on to medical school at Temple for four years and stayed in that area just outside of Temple. It's called Chestnut Hill Family Practice Residency. Uh, During med school, I really decided family medicine was the field that fit my personality the most. I am a lifelong learner. You know, I probably would be in academia if I was great about, again, having people tell me what to do, but I don't quite like that. But I am a a lifelong learner. Again, with the gender affirming care, it's not something that we're really taught in schools. It's taken quite a bit for me to, um, you know, really do extra conferences and lectures and even sort of talking with colleagues that have done it for a long time to kind of understand uh, the nuances of gender affirming care and will continue to learn about it. I'm a part of a a bunch of groups that honestly are commenting and chatting daily. So my background is, is that basis, but I do a lot of additional work outside of that, which most doctors do. You have to kind of keep up with what you're doing, but I I like to do additional work to learn about, to do deep dives into the areas that I really like. When did you know you wanted to become a doctor? I'm one of those that has known, like, I would say elementary school. It was before I probably could even put a name to it. I just knew I liked taking care of things. I was like the kid that got the science set and, like, took apart the frog. You know, I loved the human body, and I liked taking care of of things and then realized that, you know, I like taking care of people. And I come from a family of educators. My mom was a teacher, my dad was a substitute teacher, my grandma teacher and a pillar in her community. Um, my aunts are teachers, so <laughs> very heavy educational uh, people in the background of education. And I remember telling my mom I wanted to be a teacher at one point. She was like, just, you can be a teacher as a doctor. And it's true, that's exactly what I, I do. I educate people often. I had some other role models, not necessarily in the family. I I was lucky to, my brother, who's uh, four years older than me, is a physician also. I think we are the first ones in our kind of like immediate family. 
when you become or when you decide to practice medicine, do you have to decide right away a specialty? Oh, no, you absolutely don't. So I didn't know I wanted to be a family doctor until uh, probably the end of my second year in medical school. I knew that I really loved kids. And for a long time, I was like, well, maybe I'll be a pediatrician. And family doctor in school, I didn't see a lot of them. I didn't have a lot of role models for like the family doctor. I don't know why, because that's, you know, who we all typically go to when we're um, getting our, our primary care. But then when I realized I could marry sort of my interest in peds with my interest in women's health, which I have a very strong interest in, um, and not have to give up adults, I was like, oh, yeah, family is it. And now, as I've been practicing for decades, I understand, like, the amount of education that you do with people, um, it's, it's more than just sort of the, you have a cough, and here's the diagnosis, and here's medicine. I feel that I'm I'm doing quite a bit of education, counseling, you know, all of those things. So it, it, it hits a lot of things that um, I really am passionate about. On my end as a patient, doing that too, looking for ways to not just say, well, it's just a doctor, it doesn't matter, but say, how can I find somebody that I can form a relationship with? Absolutely. I think in our world today, we are very fast paced and we think it doesn't matter. We think, let me just hop on a telemedicine call. I don't know this doc. I have a cough. Let me just get some antibiotics. But the truth is, truly developing that doctor-patient relationship is important. It's empowering to you. It can also decrease your own anxiety over your own health because you know this doctor is learning who you are over time. You know, is this a doctor that has a lot of compassion? They have time for me. And if you don't get that sense, if you have the ability to shift, it is okay to do so. Your health, I think, will benefit from having a strong doctor-patient relationship as opposed to running to an urgent care for a quick physical because you need it for something. Food for thought. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of on topic still, but a few days ago you shared, for me, I thought was a very candid post on Instagram. And... I wrote down a part or copied down a part that really stood out for me and that I also related to um, just in my life today. But um, I'll just read this quickly is that you said part of what you said is I listened and followed an inner voice that reminded me there is more of me. Society's notion of you have nothing to do with you. Your voice is one that matters. And yeah, I just really felt that. How was it for you writing that? and releasing it to the world. It's part of my journey of of healing. I'm a late blooming queer person. I'm a late blooming trans person. I don't have regret looking back on the years that I didn't notice that part of myself. I think it's all about evolution in this life. But I think to be able to voice my journey helps me. It supports me in the decisions that I'm making along this journey. And I really do hope, and I know a lot of people say this, but I hope someone sees me and maybe realizes some things about themselves earlier. And it doesn't have to be that they're queer or trans, but another a voice that they're kind of letting people around them silence, letting society silence. I came from a, an open family. Um, to an extent. I mean, we all are still bound by society. So things weren't talked openly about gay people when I was coming up that they, it still felt like a little bit of a mystery or that's that one uncle over there. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I wish I had seen myself earlier. I didn't see queer. I didn't see mask lesbians um, of color. And that's important. I didn't see a lot of trans people. And those things were important. I think if I had, I would have saw some more connections earlier. And to be able to share that, it's healing for me, but also in hopes that there's someone out there that it it affirms, makes them feel less anxious about themselves, less depressed about themselves, lets them put that finger on, oh, that's that's the little thing that feels a little different about me. Maybe I can explore that more and come into myself a little, you know, sooner. One of the things I like, too, in that post is that 
you didn't negate your past at all. You didn't say, I, w- I wasn't experiencing happiness in my life. It's just, this was needed to take it to the next level. Yeah, that was very important for me to say, because when people think about trans folks or maybe queer folks, but I'll even sort of say specifically trans folks, there is this thought that people felt terrible in their body before, and then they transition and now they feel great. And it's this very sort of black and white binary view of good and bad. And the problem with that, and I'm not negating some people who have that feeling, you've got some trans kids who are like, I am not a girl, I am a boy, I know that, I wanna walk with the boys, I'm a boy, I should have boy parts. Like they have that very, distinct feeling and the dysphoria that comes with it and it needs to be addressed. That happens. There are also quite a few people who don't have that distinct feeling. And because of that, I don't want someone thinking they're not trans enough, they're not non-binary enough because they don't have that feeling. And so it's just important for people to see that I, I was happy. I was married to a cis male thought I was a cis woman, had three kids in a nice house and a white picket fence and and without the pet, you know, like sort of that, that goal and dream that people think of. I was happy. Um, There just is more to me. And when I had some more time to slow down in different parts of my life and explore and see more and expose myself to more, you know, I was able to deepen into those things. I want people, other folks who might not have, again, that sort of extreme heart, extreme feeling to understand that this can also be a gentler feeling that's still there and can be present too. If it's okay to ask, how has it um, been with those around you going on the journey with you? I feel very loved. I have a supportive family of siblings that were very tight and I now have my own children and my own partner who is extremely supportive. And I really feel that love and I feel very, very grateful for it. I do not want to make it seem like it hasn't been challenging because it is. You're not just fighting against your family, you're also fighting against society. And again, the things that you've been told and taught yourself that you've, all, that you've internalized. Coming out as queer and trans, you're, you're doing that potentially at work. Um, I'm doing it every day if I go out and someone hears a voice, they they say is feminine, but then sees someone that they are, they, they view as male. And even with my loving family, they didn't initially know a lot about like transitioning and what I truly meant when I said, yeah, I'm, I'm non-binary. I'm a trans guy. Like, what does that even mean? And, and are you going to be on hormones? Are you going to have surgery? You know, there's so many questions that still come up. And some things they probably have to undo too. Stereotypes they may have to undo because like this is someone they love. They don't want to ostracize them. So so now they have to do some work. And I expect that the road will continue to be challenging and continue to be beautiful too. I like that. (laughs) Because the conversation has become more public in the last few years, thankfully. I have been sitting with myself and saying how much of who I am or how I present is organic and how much of it is because this is what I think people expect out of me. Yeah. And that question, I honestly think that it's, is a tough question for queer and trans people because then there's also sort of this idea of what is queer and what is trans. And so are you moving towards that or are you also still living in your own truth? And so there is a nuance there as well. Um, I was in a support group the other night with a few trans men and um, non-binary people. And the idea that you can love who you are, this, this identity that is yours, and not change your body, not take anything to change your face or, or anything, like, could you do that and be okay? And some people can, but no one will ever affirm their identity. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making much sense, but like, if, you, if you're if you a trans guy, <clears throat> but you were born a woman, and you don't do any changes to yourself physically, but you want people to view you as a trans man, our environment and our world is not set up that way yet. People are going to see a woman. 
But if that person doesn't want to change, then they are the ones that have to sit there with that angst, not because they wanted to change themselves physically. They just wanted people to view them as the, as they, as they truly view themselves. Mm. What are some of the um, maybe myths that you've had to let go of? That's a, I think it's a great question. I think manhood, like what manhood is. <laughs> yeah. Like, in the beginning, I, I was really, and I don't know, I shouldn't say beginning because I don't know where the beginning was, but there's periods of my transition that I've thought, am I moving towards this masculinity and idea of manhood that I've seen around me or am I creating a new one? I was scared. I was like, how do I be a man? <laughs> you know, like, I don't, like, I feel this deep inside, but like, how do I walk like that? Like, if someone comes and gives me a handshake, like, how do I do that? You know, my son, he's been walking through life as a man for 16 years so one of his friends comes up and gives him a handshake and they, they do their handshake and it's just like it's second nature and I was like I've never done, I've never really done that handshake now all of a sudden people are extending their hands in this way to shake my hand in that specific way and it feels awkward you know I know it's just like silly it's a handshake but it's like this idea of like well now I'm walking through the world and people are viewing me as a man and what does that truly mean and how does that mean I should act um and so the myth is sort of busting this idea that there's one way to be a man. Like I have to bust that with myself, you know, and realize that that's who I am. And so however I'm acting is the way that it is. Exactly. Um, so that's honestly, that's, that's probably been the biggest one. Mm, okay. To kind of get back to Resolve MD and just, you know, when you were uh, getting it off the ground, I, I really liked uh, you were in episode 44 of my DPC story podcast. And you open up about, you know, the logo design and then how the practice fared during the COVID-19 pandemic. What was the period like, the COVID-19 period like for you as, as, a, as a medical professional? Yeah, it was a, I think it was a scary time uh, for sure for some reason, and I can't quite explain why, I was very invested in COVID-19 and COVID well before it hit the U.S. I was something I just caught wind of, and I was reading about how it was devastating other countries before, even, even around my colleagues, it just wasn't being talked about that much. I happened to join some doc groups of other people who were concerned, like, is this coming here? So I feel lucky in the sense I had my own practice. I felt like I could really control the safety. I really delved into sort of learning how to keep safe. And at the time I wasn't partnered and I really um, wanted to make sure I kept my, my kids safe too. Um, I closed my practice to in-person visits, but I already do virtual care here. And I know that was a new world for other um, practices to really delve into because there wasn't as much virtual um, care being done. Insurances were against it. And so that's something that has shifted with um, the pandemic. You know, and that's when I started another business, which was a COVID-19 testing business, which went very well. And I also started a program for people who were at high risk for COVID to be able to get secondary care with me, even if I wasn't their uh, physician. And that was born out of watching the abysmal numbers of the racism that Black people were facing when having COVID symptoms and going to the hospital and being turned away and unfortunately dying. And I felt like I could do a small part by opening a program up specifically to kind of combat that. Once we got to the other side of it, thankfully, how was it to um, reintroduce people to in-person visits? People didn't want to come back in. <laughs> they were, you know, folks were like, well, we've been doing virtual, so what's the reason? And I think that, you know, the nice part of this practice is if, if I don't need to have you come in, then you don't. The one thing I would say sort of, which I think a lot of people talk about post-pandemic is I don't think we realize the devastating effects that it has had on all of us and that we're still kind of combing through a lot of that. Our children are still combing through a lot of that, having sort of missed that social time. Um, that developmental time in school and around peers, um, the anxiety uh, and distress that we all kind of carried knowing that we're in this sort of world that just feels very bizarre. And then now being kind of pushed back into sort of a very similar world prior to the pandemic. I think that there's a lot of stress that I think we'll all probably unpack for a while. So just making sure to acknowledge that I think is important. 
I think sometimes my kids like, can I stay home for a day? There was this period of time they were used to being home and now all of a sudden we're thrust back in. I try to give them those mental health, I call them mental health days. I'm like, mm-hmm. if you're fine and you're not trying to avoid anything specifically, then yeah, let's stay home. Let's just get a day to kind of reset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the truth. <laughs> now, I also brought up the logo design and, you know, for personal slash creative reasons, because I, I do do graphic design. That's a large part of what I've done for years. But what was that like for you coming up with the name? And then the next step was to, you know, to create the logo, the image. Oh, it's, it's funny. I'm part of a group called Direct Primary Care Physicians. This is where a lot of the doctors sort of have modeled things after each other in terms of opening up a subscription-based practice. And so logo design and name of your practice is a big thing. And people kind of said, well, they came from a lot of theirs were just sort of pairing themselves with like an animal or, or something. And my thought was, well, what would be my sort of spirit, <laughs> my spirit animal? And so I thought about it for a while and I thought resolve went along well with a lion. Uh, the colors blue to me are calming. You can probably see behind me the walls in most of my office are blue, trying a connection with the water in a peaceful setting. And so the blue and then the lion sort of denoting sort of that determination, grit and resolve. That That's what all came together for me with the with the logo. We kind of touched on that you use your, of course, your professional experience, but use your personal experience to encourage and to educate how do you go about choosing or deciding when to do that? That's a great question, too, because in a lot of conferences that I've gone to around gender affirming care, like medical conferences, and there will definitely be trans folks there because that's going to be a passion that they have to learn more about it and how to provide it, is the question of when do you disclose and if you disclose. Um, because you don't want anyone to think, well, just because I'm trans means I know exactly what's going on with you. Maybe it's far from the truth. But I would say that I typically vary out with being trans to any patient that's coming here for queer or trans related care. I do want them to know that they can feel like they're in a safe space uh, because they are being taken care of by a trans physician. I try not to overly emphasize it so that they can feel like they are unique because they are in their journey. But if there's specific questions and even if they go become more personal, it's a little bit of a a grayer area. I do allow that because we're a minority, right? And I don't know how many queer trans physicians there are across the U.S. that are out, especially one of color. And then again, especially one who's black. So if someone's going to ask me more personal questions from that realm, I will certainly answer them. When I started to follow you on social media, it's not my experience first person, but it did bring some some sort of, I don't know, pride is the right word, but it was like, oh, well, of course that's needed. And, and great that that's, that's out there and, and you're showcasing that. Yeah. I'm an introvert, so... At times it does feel weird to me. And the very first time, this is before I was out with being trans, but I was out with being queer. And I wanted to have some things on my website to make sure people knew, one, it was a safe space, but also it was safe because you were gonna get care by a queer doctor. And I went back and forth on whether I should do that. And then I told myself, I absolutely should. We're in such a minority here, it's important. And I remember belaboring that point Sometimes I do my own web work, um, my design work, and I I put a page up. That very next day, I had a woman call me who was interested in um, enrolling her daughter. But she wanted to say, I just want to get you on the phone and say, thank you for that page that you put up. I've never seen anything like it. My daughter is queer and we're working on, you know, accepting this and understanding what this means for her. And to see that gave me hope. And since then, that's all I've needed. (laughs) I knew like there is a space for this. There's a need for this. People need to see themselves. Parents need to see thriving people because when they hear this about their kid, they're like, oh my goodness, I'm scared for my kid. But when they see someone who's thriving, it can also help. So, Touching on on culture and and race, what kind of feedback have you gotten specifically around that? Either being 
within the LGBT community or just in the medical profession in, in, in general? When I talk about queer issues and then trans issues, I'm actually able to more freely talk about Black issues. And that's actually a little bit sad. Racism is often swept under the rug. I know we're moving into a time where it's talked about more, but I certainly know when I was coming up and when I was in school, to talk about racism meant you were complaining, you were whining, you wanted a handout. The gaslighting, if you will, (laughs) that are associated with race. But now as I talk about queer and trans issues, there is no way someone can sit there and nod their head about a trans issue because it's more PC to be in affirmation of a trans issue. And if you're a trans person, you're like, yes, yes, yes. So if I now talk about race and all of a sudden you don't want to hear about it, you are now facing your own level of racism. Walking the earth as a black trans queer person, race is the first thing that I've had the most obstacles with and will always be. And so I love to be able to talk about the intersection of that. When I go on trainings, when I'm a speaker, if I'm talking about trans and queer issues, you now have to listen to race. You don't have a choice. Mm. You know, I mentioned in the intro that you were in the um, Out Talk series, Gender Affirmation, A Social and Medical Lens. How often are you able to speak connected to being trans or just being a doctor? Uh, uh, How often are you able to speak publicly? Yeah, right now it's been more relegated to um, more community events. Um, I have been practicing for a long time and I can find the clinician part of me is it's wonderful, but I'd also want the educator sort of away from the exam room part to blossom a bit more. And so this year is that's part of sort of things that are uh, expanding and growing um, with my care to be able to talk to organizations and and train. And I, I was at the doctors with my kid the other day and, you know, there's some attempts to use pronouns, you know, maybe you can find a gender neutral bathroom somewhere, but you can tell like there's just a lot of work to be done. And I've rarely gone into a place where it's done well or right yet. And so I really feel like there's a need. And, you know, given my experience, I know that I can feel that need. And, in, 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 you know, along with others, there are plenty of people doing it. I just want to add myself to. When you're not educating, what do you do to unwind or relax? That's great. Um, I like to spend time with my partner. We are both busy in our professional lives and then uh, rearing our children and finding space to just kind of let those things go for a bit and uh, be ourselves is nice. We have times where we're just like, let's go to a happy hour. And it may be around the corner for an hour. And it really is just a break to kind of reset and you know feel like an adult with not a lot of responsibilities. <laughs> and I also have, you know, spas that I enjoy uh, going to and honestly hanging out with the queer or trans community. If there are events in D.C., I find those life giving and there are events all the time. But on a on a day to day basis, being able just to have a moment to exercise, meditate, read a little bit, even flip through a book that has some great photography. Those are one thing, you know, another thing that I like to do. Uh, Those are ways to kind of reset. Mm. Do you have any upcoming engagements that you would like to share about? I have a, a two projects that I'm starting and, and, and launching soon that I'm excited about. I'm starting to offer consulting courses, not just for organizations, but actually for the loved ones of people who are um, transgender and also neurodivergent. Um, it's something that I have spend a lot of time working with people about and the courses are are going to be related to unpacking transphobia if it's a transgender loved one so if you're the spouse of someone who's transgender if you're the if you're the parents of someone who's transgender or good friends and being able to sort of work one-on-one with me through unpacking transphobia and supporting that loved one is something that I am developing and launching really soon. And then, and the second one is actually surrounding neurodivergence, which is another area that I'm very passionate about and deal a lot with 
in primary care and I see a lack of access to and a lack of knowledge of. And people would say, well, what's the reason for, for these? And the reason is, is we know that people with cer certain marginalized identities really do poorly in the world if they do not have a nice foundation and nice support. And, and not everyone. There are plenty of people who push through, have the grit and will and determination. But the numbers overall show a good percentage of people without that foundation have higher rates of anxiety, depression, unfortunately, suicide. And so this is something to combat that. This is something to sort of acknowledge where you can create that foundation. You know that that loved one has to go out in the world and face all these issues and challenges of being either neurodivergent or being trans. How can you make home, the home base, as affirming as possible? So those are two things I'm really excited about, being able to work with people one-on-one -on -one with, a little bit outside the exam room, a little more cerebral, but, uh, and, and so that's what's, that's what's coming soon. Where can we engage with you online? Where I talk a lot about sort of the mix of being Black, trans, and queer, um, and talk a bit about gender affirming care is at the Trans MD. So that's personal experiences as well as professional uh, comments and advice. And I pull the intersection of those things in often. And the RMD Proud has its own IG page, which is at RMD Proud. And Resolve MD has one too, which is Resolve MD underscore DPC. Um, and uh, my website also has everything, which is www.resolvemd.org. So those are the basic ways to get in touch with me. The most fun is at the TransMD, though. Okay. And I always end with asking if you have any final thoughts or insights. I'd love to see, um, specifically focused on the uh, transgender and non-binary folks, is uh, three things and that's one when people introduce themselves that they give their pronouns especially in medical settings because it gives space for the trans and gender diverse person to do the same uh, number two i'm always talking about bathrooms gender neutral bathrooms it's a bigger issue than anyone can even imagine and number three uh, especially in medical settings, making sure that you are giving a space for someone's chosen name uh, in medical records and also when you're introducing yourself and asking them what that is. So those are my closing thoughts in terms of 2024 in the trans community. I would love for those three things to be more commonplace. Thank you for spending time with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, comment, and subscribe. Share with your friends too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Our Black Gay Diaspora and on Twitter at BLK Gay Diaspora. Until next time.